Welcome to the VJ Podcast. I have here with me today Ghost. Hello. This is uh, Borvek taking control of this one because Velvet is unwell. And for today we have the wonderful author of the Ruby books, E.C. Myers. Hi. Thanks for that thank lovely intro. <laughs> for joining us today. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. I'm Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am sorry. I'm just not breathe. Good it's with, all uh, good. Interest. It's all good. <laughs> um, so to start off with, I just wanted to think it would be a little bit fun to look at the pro uh, writing process behind Roman holidays. We like we've known uh, like we've known you from the first part uh, from the po uh, ugh, Jesus Christ English <laughs> from the first podcast you appeared on you were looking to make Roman and Neo a partner in crime style story now that's come to light did that uh, did the story around Neo and Roman's journey and the gang warfare criminal underworld story come about yeah how did that come about um, let's see so so when we started talking about doing a third book you know we were kicking around. Um, ideas for what that could be, and of course, Roman, Roman and Neo's, uh, you know, quote origin story uh, was at the top of the list. Um, I have been interested in writing this since I saw a really fantastic uh, illustration by Courtney Brennick a while back. Uh, she tweeted about it, and I was like, you know, a, a YA novel just popped into my head. And it was, it was, it, it wasn't like a plot that dropped into my head, but like seeing those two characters, kind of the younger versions of them. I'll say like maybe happier versions of them. Um, it just sparked an idea of like the the kind of relationship that they that they could have had and like the adventures that they could have had before we see them on the show, right? So so that's what I meant when I was like, oh, you know, YA novel just popped in my head. But at that moment, the name the title Roman Holiday did pop into my head. Um, I am a notorious punner. Um, and that is a really bad pun, but, uh, I love the film, you know, Roman holiday, but like that, that title popped into my head and that kind of gave mm. me the idea for, um, a book that I could follow. And I'm, I'm delighted that we were able to actually use that as the title because we had to kind of clear that with legal and make sure that it seemed appropriate and everything. And, uh, actually once you start digging into the, the, the term Roman holiday, it ended up having much more meaning than just being a pun. Like it feels like completely appropriate for, for this book. Um, but thinking about what that origin story would would actually be, it was you know I felt like I needed it needed to be like them first meeting and getting to know each other, you know, and that relationship growing from there. And you know, I had some details about Neo's backstory, um, really just like very broad strokes of uh, little details from her past that I was able to use. So I sort of knew that I would be following. Um, Neo story from when she was younger and from there like the idea of doing like some time jumps until we get to kind of like the time period where she's going to interact with Roman uh so that's where that came in and 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 Roman I didn't expect to actually because he's older than than Neo um which we've established canonically um I didn't expect to start him from like very young. I decided I wanted their 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 parallel stories to really line up with each other. So at the moment that you see Neo in the opening chapter where I think she's eight, when you see Roman's chapter, he's, you know, uh, what, 18. Um, that's that's uh, simultaneous. Like the, the timing is is the same. So it's not like we're jumping around in their backstories um, at different at different rates. Um and so Neo, I, I had to think about like where these characters came from. And Neo, it seemed to make sense for her to it, actually. I think part of the backstory was I think that that she wasn't she was in Vale, like at a school in Vale. Um, and then for Roman, I was like, I thought that it might be interesting if he came from outside of Vale, um, partially as an opportunity to show more of Remnant. And um, he feels like a newcomer, right? When you see him in uh, in the red trailer, the, no, the yellow trailer. So. So I thought, you know, Mistral would make make sense for him. Just thinking about like he's not he's not going to come from Vacuo, that's for sure. Um, you know, he definitely doesn't have you know <laughs> he doesn't scream Atlas to me either. You know, uh, he might mantle might have worked, but uh, yeah. once I settled on Mistral, you know, obviously I started thinking about like the criminal element of Mistral, and of course you have Little Miss. Malachite from there, and that's kind of where that started to develop from. It's like, okay, well, Roman's backstory is going to be how he became the criminal, um, the criminal that we see, 
And then Neo's story is going to be her growing up in Vale and eventually their paths crossing. And um, and so it was really a, a wonderful opportunity to show a little bit more of Mistral than we got to see even on the show and to delve a little bit more into little Miss Malachite and the spiders who we don't see really in great detail on the show as well. And um, that's kind of what I go for with these books when, when I have the freedom to kind of explore a little bit, to try to expand on stuff that we've seen already that we, that we maybe uh, you won't get to see again or won't get to see in detail. Like with Vacuo, um, it was going to be a long time before we got to Vacuo. So that, that was a fun mm. thing to explore. Yeah. Oh, I loved exploring Vacuo. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just reminiscing, thinking back, oh, the good times we had in Vacuo and the good times yet to come. Uh, so uh, Absolutely. So uh, overall, when it comes to writing a Ruby book, what is the general process behind writing it? Uh, yeah, and you know, it's funny now that we've had you know three of them, there is kind of a general process, right? Um, it usually starts with brainstorming, and that brainstorming might be me with my editor at Scholastic, you know, just kind of the two of us talking about plot um, ideas before we go to to uh, Kruby, because Kruby, like Miles and Eddie and Carrie, like they're all super busy, so you know it's better to come with them to them with some ideas. Um, mm so that we can kind of talk from there, you know, and you may not end up doing any of those ideas or whatever, or that you might mash them together, but it's, it's, it's sometimes it seems better to kind of start, start, uh, you know, early and just come to them with something that they can respond to. Um, so that's generally the process or sometimes the brainstorming actually involves Kruby from the beginning. And I think, um, on this one, I taught on, on Roman holiday, uh, I hashed out a plan. We didn't know what book we were going to do necessarily. Um, it was, an, it, I have a plot, set up for a, a third uh, coffee, you know, sun vacuo book. And that's Ooh. kind of the, that was, that was kind of the, the starting off point. But uh, so we presented that and then we had a couple of other ideas. And then when we talked to Kruby because of the production schedule and like when the, and the fact that the show is now catching up to the books, uh, it didn't make sense um, to continue the vacuo story at this point. Um, there still may be a vacuum, another vacuum book at some point. I, I would love to be able to do that, but, um, it just didn't, it wasn't a good idea, um, leading into, into volume nine and, and what follows to, um, to kind of delve into that area again. So we started thinking about other stories and of course, Roman and Neo, uh, was a big one. So we sort of brainstormed in that session. Um, and that brainstorming was really kind of like, yes, we want to do this. Here's what we know about Neo. Um, here's what you know about, about Roman, um, that you can use. And then they kind of sent me away to go and, uh, come up with some kind of story from that. Um, and so that's the next pro part of the process. Like we talk about things, I, I hear about things that they want me to include or that I can include. I come, I go away, I come back with a plot. Um, and then, you know, I come, I come up with an outline, like I sketch out basically the entire book, um, and it doesn't have to be in detail, but I tend to, once I get into it, I tend to, to really flesh things out. So there might be, my outlines uh, could really just be like a, a, a paragraph for each chapter, but often I get so into it that they actually start to include little scenes and snippets of dialogue and descriptions and things like that. So my, my outlines tend to be sort of, sort of um, pretty detailed. And that's super helpful when I get to the drafting stage, because I already have these like key moments that I can, I can work around. Um, so I write up the outline, we send it, we send it, I send it to my editor, my editor, uh, works on it. Um, and then we share it with, with Rooster Teeth. And then we will typically have like another call, another, you know, voice video chat to discuss, um, the outline, um, develop things further or whatever. And then once I update the outline based on the discussion, uh, send it out again, once I get the green light, start writing the book. Yeah. yeah. Uh, was I, there I any... never knew that you oh. have to make a sketch in order to write a book. Yeah, you know, and I think that, um, you know, I saw somebody on Twitter talking about, you know, people in uh, screenwriting complaining about, uh, like, they don't like to outline. You know, I used to not like to outline either when I was just writing my own, my own books, uh, my own, like, st original stories. Um, but when you're working with tie-ins uh, or work for hire, you typically do need to outline because everyone has to kind of be like literally on the same page. Like they need to see what the book is going to look like and figure all that stuff out before you start spending that time drafting things. 
And uh, sometimes things deviate from the outline a little bit when you're write, actually writing it. It may not make sense anymore. New ideas do occur to, to me while I'm writing, or, I'm, or I get surprised by things like I might introduce a character mm. that kind of um, captures my my interest, and I might spend more time, you know, on another uh, developing something that didn't that wasn't originally um, even included in the outline because it just was pure invention. Um, but the outline in general is, is really good. And I've written I've written a book where I, I wrote the outline. Everyone approved it. I wrote the book. This was not a Ruby project. This was um, my third novel, Silence of Six. Um, I've, I we proved the outline. I wrote the book based on the outline. And when we all looked at the the book, it just it didn't work. Like it, so, I had to go and, and rewrite a, a big chunk of it because even though it, on paper like it looked like it was it made sense when you actually get into the the narrative and you kind of get a better feeling of the pacing and the character development and all that other stuff. Um, it just wasn't, you know, gelling as well as it could be. So th at that point I had to go and, and, and rework things. Um, but yeah, you know, I write the book to the outline. I write a first draft. I sh send it to my editor. Um, he'll, um, he'll uh, send me some feedback, you know, uh, make some suggestions. I'll revise it. And then we send it to, to rooster teeth and then they read it and they give, they give their notes on it. And then they send it back, and then um, I'll revise it again. And you kind of, you know, wash and, and repeat until wash and repeat until until like everyone is happy with the final project product. Hmm. I certainly enjoyed the books. Hmm. Thank you. I'm really glad. I'm glad to hear that. I'm I'm really glad that people seem to have overall responded well to Roman Holiday because uh, that one in particular, I thought had. I, I was feeling more pressure on that one um, for for a number of reasons. Uh, the timeline was pretty short, but by the time we finally got the green light, that that book was going to happen. Like I had to write it really fast because we had to hit a certain publication date. Um, I was also writing it. This was my pandemic book. I wrote it like in the midst of the pandemic, and also during election season in the United States. Um, and there was a lot of distraction coming from the news and, uh, you know, concerns. Never watch the news. Well, it's hard. And unfortunately, I, I spend a lot. I spend too much time on Twitter and Twitter is just like the doom scrolling on Twitter is 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 pretty distracting. But I also couldn't write the way I normally would write. Like when I'm when I'm writing, I, I'm used to having my own space and 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 peace and quiet. But my son was home all year, you know, doing school. I couldn't leave the house. Like sometimes I, you know, I'm that writer who actually <laughs> does go and writes in libraries and coffee shops and things like that, just to get a different space and to have some, you know, a different uh, environment. And I couldn't do that. So I was sitting in my guest, our guest room in the basement of my house, trying to uh, work while my, while my son was doing his schoolwork upstairs. And there's just a lot of distraction. And then, and then the pressure of these characters are, are beloved characters <laughs> In the series, like people knew, people liked coffee, right? Before, before, after the fall, people liked coffee, but you had very little information mm -hmm. about Team that. Coffee as a whole. Um, the most you knew about was Velvet, and there was a there was a little more wiggle room, I think, you know, in in creating something something new from that. Uh, Roman and Neo were pretty firmly established, at least, you know, their present characters, and people loved them, and. Part of the thing that people loves about love about them, I think, is that they were kind of like a a blank slate in a way, uh, where you could fill in you know whatever headcanon you wanted, write whatever fan f fan fiction stories you wanted, and here I am coming along and saying, well, this is how it was, you know, this is the canon backstory, you know. So so I think that there is a lot of uh, pressure, at least on me, um, mm, as a lot as, of the... yeah, yeah, you know, as a as a as a writer, you know. Uh, you know, having the privilege of writing these characters, but then also as a fan, like I am a fan of the show, and knowing that other fans were going to be happy or not happy with with whatever I came up with, you know. Uh, was there any inspiration you used when creating the story, like elements from Ruby or films or other shows? Like, how did you find inspiration, or where did you find it from? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I find inspiration from every everything, you know, just just you know, walking down the street, um, or and certainly certainly there's inspiration from 
almost you know every every show I've watched and every book I've read that I've you know that's really connected with me. So some of that inspiration I can't I can't draw a straight line from from that to whatever might appear in the books because um, you know some of that's just so kind of in, ingrained. But as far as far as Ruby goes, I find inspiration from from Ruby itself. You know, I watched the show um, and I look for moments that uh, define the characters, mm -hmm. things that I can use, things that I can call back to, things that can kind of maybe prefigure uh, events in the story. Um, but I look at like all of Ruby. And so, you know, I know that Ruby Chibi isn't canon, right? Because um, how, how could it be? But Ruby Chibi is fantastic. And uh, Ruby Chibi yeah. also happens to be, you know, I probably, probably Roman and Neo have appeared more on Ruby Chibi than they have, you know, in the show proper, at least up until like the most recent seasons. And so I look at that as like, the actual show. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, even though those aren't <laughs> canonical, those aren't canonical characters, there's an element of like, we'll call it truth. Like their, their, their characters still come out from like their interactions in chibi right like in chibi and that's kind of like i have i draw on that as well and so there are some some callbacks to ruby chibi little things that hopefully don't don't break the story but you know like you know you can call it fan service i guess um but just like little moments that you know i maybe yeah. they don't necessarily add a lot to the book they don't necessarily hopefully they don't also distract from the book but if you know ruby and you know ruby chibi then you'll see that and be like oh you know i get that you know i get that reference um but i also looked at uh you know especially yeah. for mistral i looked at uh the grim campaign that eddie revis has been running uh which had which is canon to the series and it really goes a lot into into the the criminal I don't even want to necessarily the underworld of Mistral because it's so blatant. Um, you know, it's part of the culture of Mistral. Um, so I really looked to that. Um, and and Mistral. I looked for, I looked, yes, yeah, just Mistral. And I looked for opportunities to kind of uh, weave that into the story as well to, to reinforce um, the canonicity of both properties, you know. Um, so you may not follow the Grim campaign, but you should if you're not if you're not listening or watching. I, I listen to it um, when I'm walking my dog, but you know you can't sit there and actually watch it on your on your computer. Um, you know, just to you know th that's all part of the rich world building of Ruby. Um, even things from like you know mm. combat ready, you know the board game. Like I will take whatever scraps I can find. You know. Um, even even you know the the comic books if there's something in the canon of the comic books that that works like i know i know roman's uh presentation in one of the comics wasn't wasn't accurate so i pretty much i kind of just kind of dismiss that but um i look for everything and i look for mm. way and and all of that you know whether i include it in the book or not all of that kind of like rolls into my head and just kind of like inspires you know my approach to them but uh i was i was in the fortunate place where at least at least for 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 Roman, uh, there was a lot of he was in the, the the series a lot, and so I had a pretty good idea of his character and how to capture his voice and his personality. Um, capturing Neo's quote voice um, is tough because so much of her, um, I mean her her only interactions are visual, and so figuring out how to do that was was an interesting challenge. And Neo Neo speaks more through body like language mentioned. or apparently text. Mm -hmm. Well, there's enough there was enough of her texting, and it makes sense, right? It makes sense that she would use that. Um, she she may not have used that too often with with Roman because as I as I established, like they just understand each other pretty well. But we've seen her texting, you know, um, Cinder. Mm -hmm. we, um, we've seen her texting Roman even like this. This technology exists, and if you could not speak. You would use you would absolutely use that technology to some extent, except we find that she does not like using voice to speech, right? Um, so and I you know so and I made that kind of yeah. like a, a plot element of it. Um, you know she would probably just be happier if people didn't understand her than to go to certain lengths to make sure that she's communicating like what she means, right? Mm. Yeah, I get that. Well, speaking of um, different inspirations, uh, what do you find for the characters that you create, like new characters for the books? Oh, you mean like sort what, of like uh, the what kind of inspirations do you find for them? Mm. Um, I think yeah, a lot like of the them... side characters here and there. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of that stems from 
thinking about like, what do I need for the story? Um, you know, it's interesting, like uh, Honey from uh, Roman Holiday initially was just, it just appeared in that opening, that opening Roman chapter is just like he, you know, she was just like a character who he just mentions, you know, and I, I didn't actually in initially have any intention of bringing her on screen or having her be kind of even, you know, instrumental in um, him getting captured. But once I had written the character and I knew her, her semblance and she seemed interesting, um, it just made sense to like use her in a, in a, in a, in a, stronger way you know so some some of the characters are, are just there because you need you need right. people for them to interact with um but you know i thought that her you know she she and, and she and roman also had like a connection you know a lot of that happens off screen kind of like in his backstory but um it you know it, it makes for a tighter book i think if you don't have a lot of throwaway characters, right? If you introduce a character, certainly in this, in the first, in this first chapter or the first chapter, yeah. you see him, like it makes sense um, to bring them back, you know, cause otherwise, why did you spend all this time establishing, Check off you know, gun. this, this character? Yeah. Um, and I guess I tend yeah. to think about as far as inspiration, I tend to think about what haven't we seen on the show before? Um, what doesn't exist already? Um, because I tend to want to create something new. Um, and, uh, yeah, although I know, you know, with Chameleon, I think actually when I was coming up with Chameleon, I think I'd sort of forgotten about Ilya, Ilya's, uh, abilities, but because she's a faunus, that wasn't a summer. <laughs> so it, it, you know, you, you see it all, you see yeah, it a lot it actually. And, and, yeah. and actually, I think I like the fact that I'm established that, that through the books we've established because you see, you see more of the world through the books, um, than you get on the show. Um, I like establishing the fact that like, yeah, yeah, there are people who have similar talents, similar semblances or things that overlap, um, or they have nuanced, uh, you know, uh, differences in their abilities. So like Carmen, um, also has telekinesis like Linda, but her, her telekinesis is very different. Like she can only manipulate lots of small objects at a time. Mm. You know, Glinda is super powerful, you know, or, you know, almost OP with her abilities. Control atoms and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't oh, think Carmen definitely. is, is, that, is yeah. that fine, but if you have her in a, a sand environment, like her being able to manipulate sand oh, is yeah, a really you're, cool you're in trouble. Then is a really cool asset there. And then having burlap who can manipulate, you know, temperature. Um, it's almost like you have two pieces of cinder there, you know, cause she can make glass. Um, so, so yeah. some of it, some of that comes from like, what do I need for the story? You know, but, um, but it also has to make sense, you know, like I can't, cause you know, you, you don't want it to just be a convenient, I think my, my writing group calls it like plot coupons, you know, where something is in the story just because it helps you advance yeah. the plot, you know, like they have to, they plot have to device. make sense. Yeah. Like a plot device. Um, you know, like they cannot, you can't just like bring something out of nowhere. So if honey just showed up out of nowhere, you know, s later on in the book and you had never mentioned her before or whatever, <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't make sense. But, you know, we kind of established her early on, hopefully, you know, enough that people will remember her when you mention her, when you, you actually interact with her again. And she doesn't seem like she came out of nowhere. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, it's hard trying to fit the CNR rules as well. The color naming yeah, rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not that. Yeah. I, I, I've talked to, I've talked to Kruby about that, and I think they, they like it. Like, they like coming up with the names. Um, for me, there's so many names, like, that have already been used. Um, it, it, it can be really, it, yeah. it's, it's the, the main reason I think that it's, it's a struggle for me is because it's so time consuming. Um, you can't just pluck any like random name and use it. It has to it has to exist within the conventions of the show, and uh, and when I'm under deadline, you know, trying to draft draft a book, I can't just spend a whole day just coming up with names. Although I have done, you know, um, but uh, yeah, but yeah. So I find it I find it I find it challenging, or even trying to find like I don't necessarily always find like a fairy tale illusion for the characters that I introduce because not everyone, not every character necessarily you know rates that. But um, the color naming, you know, and and you'll probably see me getting getting lazy. It's like okay, these characters are going to die. Their last name is Gray. Like I'm just 
every one of them has their own name, but their last, their family name is a color. And so that, that satisfies the requirement. Right. So, and a lot of, a lot of the first draft the and, and the outline, <laughs> yeah, a lot of the first draft and the outline, like I'll come Plus, up with a name just for character. And, uh, Grace. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the probably... phrase, like Star Trek red shirts. <laughs> it's like it's like Smith, you know, you know. But um, you Great know, a lot of the names a, that I come up with, <laughs> a lot of the names that I come up with in the outlines and in the first draft, like I'll flag it for for um, for Kruby and say like, is this okay? And if it's an important character, I'll give them like a definition, like why did I pick this name? Like what does it mean? You should save them the googling, right? Like why does what does this mean? Like what is the significance mm-hmm. of this of this this naming? Um, you know, like when I when I did Carmen Esclados and and Bertilac, um, you know, I gave them like this is why these characters have this this name, um, and uh, yeah, and just to flag so they can let me know like okay that doesn't work or um, you know here's an alternative or whatever. But generally they've been they've been pretty good about about uh, about the names. Like they did not stop me from naming a character Rock Salt. Or candy floss, which I've seen. I, I know some fans are probably like, "Oh, that's a little goofy." I was like, "Yeah, it, it is kind of goofy, but I don't know. I think, kinda, I think it kind of works. Fun character. I think it kind of works. Like, <laughs> yeah, I love it. I, I, think I love creativity, kind of a, man. You got to have a little bit of silliness in there. I think so. I mean, if I've you're going to read one of my books, you're going to find water as a weapon. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or a fishing pole, right? I mean, any anything, yeah. anything could be a cool weapon, like a fishing pole. Like, do you would you really think that that would be a cool weapon? And yet, you see it in action. It's like, yeah, okay, that's pretty cool. Could have been cool to combine it with like a harpoon gun. Absolutely. Hmm. Well, it's, yeah, everything's a gun, right? This, this is a harpoon it has gun. To also, be a gun. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It also is a gun. <laughs> Uh, staying on the topic of inspiration, you mentioned on an AMA about the fairy tales. Uh, you mentioned that one that was the boy who cried grim, mm. seemingly based on the boy who cried wolf. Gee, I wouldn't believe that at all. <laughs> um, were the other fairy tales inspired by real fairy tales? Um, not not really. So that was so we were spit. I was spitballing. You know, I knew. I knew that we were going to re- kind of redo some of the fairy tales that had been on the show, um, and then we had to. I had to kind of come up with a bunch of different ones. I knew we were going to do at least one Faunus story, um, and so those Faunus stories were really inspired by you know some of the some of them were inspired by titles. Like they, there was a title on the show. Somebody mentioned a story. I was like, all right, I'm going to write that story. What does that What does that story mean? You know, what what could be attached to that? The boy who cried grim was one of the spitballing ones where. Um, you know, it would have been very similar to uh, the boy who cried wolf, and and I don't remember if people just didn't like that or if it just didn't it didn't make sense. But but I knew that they wanted a dark story, um, like they specifically wanted sort of a gothic yeah. horror type story, and that one I it pretty much kind of evolved into the Grim Child because I still wanted something with a kid, and I wanted them to have kind of you know, and then the the boy who cried Grim also. Uh, I think it also was like maybe even like the boy who called Grimm or something like that. Like that kind of almost comes close to some of after the fall where they can kind of attract, you know, kind of causing like the negative emotions and kind of attracting Grimm. So I, I sort of came up with, I think that basically spun out of that. Like, and that that's kind of what happens with, with brainstorming. Like you have this one idea and you set it aside or it, the story, the story idea, the rejected story idea itself in, in turn inspires another better story idea, you know? Um, so I'm pretty sure that's where that, that came from. Um, but you know, that was just like, I think I didn't even go, go into any detail because you know what that story would be. The boy who cried grim, you know what that story would be. So it was just kind of like, here, here's some, here's a bunch of ideas. Like, let's figure out what we're going to, what we're going to write, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, the only other one, I mean, I think that, uh, I think that the girl in the tower, I mean, in, in, in the series itself, like it seems pretty evident that that is inspired by, by Rapunzel. Um, and so, so some of their story, some of their fairy tales were inspired by, you know, uh, you know, obviously real world uh, fairy tales. Hmm. Mm, yeah, of course. So, have you ever thought of like uh, mythical figures for fairy tales as well? On. No, oh, so yeah, so 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 actually, yeah. Color. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I th- I think uh, you know for better or worse one of the things that I brought. So so Ruby, 
obviously they they have a lot of fairy tale illusion. But if you look at some of the other characters, especially like the professor, mm. um, they are based on children's tales, children's stories. So not necessarily a fairy tale. I mean, you look at mm. Wizard of Oz, like that's not a fairy tale, right? That's actually a children's literature. And you look that's at really uh, Bartholomew yeah. Ublick, you know, Professor Port, like these are these are allusions to childhood stories. So uh, when I came up with some mm. of the some of the other professors, I kind of followed those rules too. Like one of them is kind of like based on the Anne of Green Gables kind of a thing. Um, you know, uh, mm. like one of the characters is like a Thumbelina, right? Kind of thing. Um, with with yeah, yeah. after the fall, I sort of diverged a little bit. I was like, all right, well, if children's tales are are fair game and fairy tales are fair game. The thing, one of the things that I really love is I love Greek and Roman mythology, which also which also um, inspires some of the characters. I mean, mm. we've got we've got Neptune, of course, um, but uh, yeah. but then there's also like a huge one that I don't think they had explored much was um, you know English English mythology, like uh, King Arthur, right? Knights of the Round Table, that that sort of stuff. Um, Celtic, yeah. Celtic, you know that stuff. So so that's where Carmen Esclados and and Burlac, uh, came from. Uh, while well, I was looking for character Ooh. inspiration, so those are those are knights from the, the 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 those are characters from the story of the Green Knight, I believe. Um, so that was kind of like my hmm. little twist on it. It's like, okay, well, I'm I'm going to start bringing this in, and and nobody said anything, nobody stopped me. So so there it is. Um, in Roman Holiday, in particular, uh, because we were dealing with the mistral kind of criminal element. Um, you have Little Miss Malachite, and she's based on uh, Little Miss Muffet. So when I was coming up with other, I wanted other criminals organizations to be in place. Um, as I started thinking of those, I thought that I would go to the same type of nursery rhyme um, uh, origins that Little Miss Muffet came from. And I forget the terminology for it, but but there's like that 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 is a particular kind of kind of rhyme and so i looked for other rhymes that were kind of in that same uh family and that's where i came up with paul parrot so there's a mm. there's a nursery rhyme called Paul parrot p o l l and he inspired that that inspired that character uh. um i think they might have mentioned another another um criminal that i i can't remember anymore um what it was but you know i basically Mm -hmm. take something that's already been established and then like riff on it you know like this this is this is me uh yeah. latching on to established world building and trying to adhere to it while also you know expand on it in some way huh. yeah um i just wanted to confirm two things in regards to names and illusions if that's fine yeah um so, uh, how did you get Trivia as Neo's name? Was it something that you chose as a group effort, or was it like uh, on your own? And, or and um, number two, a lot of people have speculated that Neo's illusion is Hecate. Okay, Hecate. I don't know how to pronounce that. Yeah. So, and I think that's probably because because that's that's basically tied into where her name came from, um, the and and that came solely from me. So, so Neo's illusion. I actually do not know if there is an actual like fairy tale illusion for Neo. I actually didn't ask. Um, it wasn't on the wiki, right? Like I I look at the wiki. Obviously, um, yeah, it's not yeah. evident in the series. But I didn't. I thought about you know I could have dug deeper and say like what is this? What, you know what is her illusion if there is one? But ultimately it didn't. It didn't seem necessary for for the character that I was writing. Like if I, if I'd known it, I might have worked in because I could be totally you know it could be something and I could have I could have worked more of it into it so it would have been more apparent. My my understanding was that Neo is just you know like a gender bent version of of Roman. At least her inspiration was from there, right? And so there might be elements like I've seen I've seen people talking like like Tinkerbell and you know, other, other things, Mary Poppins, you know, like there are Cheshire those elements, Cat. Cheshire cat, mm -hmm. like Mary Poppins makes kind of makes sense. Um, but it ultimately yeah. it doesn't, it didn't really matter. So, so the naming thing though. Okay. So the naming thing was when I was coming up with, when we were talking about this, like I knew Neo, I knew the broad strokes of Neo's backstory. I knew about her parents, like her, her upbringing. 
Um, but I didn't have details like, you know, what's their name? You know, like her name, you know, if you look at um, uh, Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle, right, they list her name as Neopolitan, right? They split her name out into Neopolitan. And I, and I did clarify, like, Politan is not her last name, mm. right? And it is not. Her name is Neopolitan on the show. And I was like, okay, but you know, she'll need at the very least she yeah. needs a family. She needs a family name. If I'm going to write her as a character, you know, as a child, like her family needs a last name. So at the very minimum, I needed to have like a last name for her and her family, and that's where Vanille came from. Um, and then of course because yeah, of the makes, ice cream it makes sense because it kind of relates back. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and because of the the ice cream motif and the and the candy motif. Uh, which I guess I play with a little bit in in this in this book in particular. You know, that's kind of where their their her parents' names came from. Jimmy is is kind of a deep cut, like, but based off of like the sprinkles that are called Jimmy's, which I had never heard that before. Uh, I started dating my wife who who grew up in Pennsylvania, and that's what they call sprinkles in Pennsylvania. And so now I know, you know, what a Jimmy is. Um, and then her name, her mom, yeah. mom's name being uh, Carmel. I didn't make it caramel. But I, I, it, the car name Carmel still like evokes that. Um, so I knew that at mm. least. And then, and then as for her name, her her actual, you know, birth name, you know, again, so the so part of part of the world building, and part of my inspiration, like where I I, I really try to dig deep and 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 just I like I said I latch on to like whatever I can get Neapolitan song right the song that 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 Neo has um I looked at the lyrics of that song and mm. it's like you know she has a, she has a new name um which was inspired kind of by by uh Torchwick or at least her taking that name was inspired by Torchwick so I decided that um she was not going to be Neapolitan you know until later this is that that is a name that she had chosen right um, and so initially mm. I was going with the candy, candy theme, right? The ice cream and candy theme. So the, the name that I had in, in my head was Kit. I was, I was going to name her like literally the Kit. outline, the outline, stupid draft idea of it was Kit Kat, like Kit, Kit Kat's like inspired us. So I was going to call her Kit. Like, I just wanted a name. Right. So then as I'm writing, as I start writing, I was like, this doesn't really fit her. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Like it doesn't fit her. It's, it's like kind of cute, but I, I don't really see her as, as a kit or a cat, you know? So I started yeah, looking yeah. up, but, but I, I sort of started using that. Like I started, like something about it, like spoke to me. Right. So I started looking up the, the kind of the etymology, I guess, of the name Kate, cat, Kate, which comes from Hecate. Um, that's kind of led me down that path. And when mm. I, when I saw that, I came to Hecate and I was like, okay, she's the goddess of crossroads. Right, that is the the uh, Greek goddess of crossroads, and that sounded amazing because Neo is is three, like a triple, right? So that seemed to fit. Mm. Um, it's it's a triple goddess. It's a triple goddess. It's a goddess of crossroads, um, and so that really stuck with me. Like that that worked for me a, a lot. And then I looked at the the Roman version of Hecate, and that is trivia. And the name Trivia is unusual. I did check. It is a real name. People have in the world have been named Trivia, uh, however unusual it is. And there was something, it was something unique and interesting enough. And again, it had the word try in it, like the three, because I had already started developing the idea of, of mm. threes, threes in this book, um, because her symbol is uh, the Triskelion, right? Or the, the, whatever the other uh, word for it is. Yeah. Um, and so I had started already developing that. So I know Ruby is typically all about fours, but Roman Holiday is about three. Um, it just, it just, it just, it just stuck with me. So I put that in. Like I named her Trivia Vanille. I liked the way that it kind of the the sound of those names together, Trivia Vanille, and um, mm. and the, you know I I proposed it and and they didn't reject it. So <laughs> so that was on me. Well, they didn't say no. So they didn't goodness. say no. And then I started seeing people responding to it because the first chapter quote leaked, you know, and people were like Trivia, like. And some people liked it and some people didn't like it. And I started sweating. I was like, oh God, what have I done? You know, uh, maybe I should have <laughs> named her something else. Um, but it's just still, like, I still stand no, by it. Like, I think, thank you. I still stand by it. Like, it, it made sense uh, thematically. And so I think I've said this before. Like, I felt like Roman Holiday, at least Neo's side of it, feels more like a traditional kind of YA novel to me. 
um, the way that I wrote her chapters. Mm. Um, it's about a young character who's kind of discovering their place in the world and um, and their identity, you know, figuring out who they are and who they who they want to become. And a lot in young adult novels, like the protagonist always has like a weird name, right? Um, an unusual name, or sometimes the, they're the name of the book, like the book is named after them, or there's something kind of almost comic booky about how appropriate their name is, or like Katniss, Katniss Everdeen, like Katniss is such a weird name, right? But people love it. So, so trivia, I was just thinking along the same lines. That's why I kind of went with Kit and like Kat, and maybe that was part of the inspiration there. Um, I just needed her to have something unusual and interesting because I could have called her, you know, Barbara Vanille or something. And that's like so boring. Like, you know, trivia, Neo needed it. Neo needed it. Yeah, right. Neo needed it. Sorry, Barbara. It's a real, it's um, Neo, Neo needed a, a kind of a unique, a unique <laughs> name. And then, and then people have talked about like sort of the symbolism involved in it. I won't go into whether or not it was necessarily planned or not, but the fact that like her parents named her trivia and whether that word has the same connotation in, in Ruby as it does in the real world, like looking at her as like a little thing, you know, she, she is small as well. Like her size, she's very small. Isn't so, like so, so I feel like there's lots of stuff that spins out of that where it, it seems, it seems, it seems right. You know, and the big, the big interesting thing with, mm. with, with Neo that I, that I thought to, especially to throw people off was that Neapolitan kind of appears in that first chapter and you think that that is your main character, but it is actually trivia, right? Uh, because Neo is just kind of her mm. imagination, like manifesting uh, her overactive imagination, her semblance manifesting this like part of her identity that she kind of has to hide, you know? Mm. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask as a side question. So there isn't, uh, so you didn't, uh, you weren't meaning to allude her character to Hecate at all. Uh, was, no, I mean, I have no idea. Very, uh, yeah. Yeah, I have no idea what her intended illusion is, if there is one. Um, I that was the origin of the name, and I think it makes sense. Like, I think that yeah. you know the way that I've written that it, especially like so, like Hecate is and trivia is like a sorceress, you know, like a sorceress, the goddess of of mm. uh, crossroads, like decisions, choices, and a triple goddess, and that all you know once i once i stumbled across it so this sometimes my research uh is a happy you know serendipitous event you know like i could you know it seems like it could have been planned from the beginning but i only came across that entire like naming possibility because i decided to start off with kitkat you know and then i kind of went into the thing and then i found happened to find yeah. something that was perfect you know at least at least look like you know thematically for this particular novel for this particular iteration of her character it is uh thematically um appropriate you know hmm. so uh hmm. when making fight scenes as i know as a writer myself making ruby fight scenes is somewhat challenging due to having to paint the pictures with words rather than animation god i wish i could animate hmm. uh but for you, was it challenging creating the fight scenes featured in the books? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, again, one of the one of the um, exciting things about Ruby, one of the things people love about Ruby, is the the choreographed fights. Right? It's a very visual show. It's very anime. I mean, it is. You know, some people will just call it an anime, um, and communicating that to the page mm. like even if even if i was just scripting something that was shown it would be hard right if somebody had already choreographed everything and then um and then i was just writing sort of the novelization of it like fight like like if i were trying to write a description of ironwood's fight against uh watts in uh two seasons ago that's an amazing scene in 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 fight. amity and if i was trying to describe it I would have a hard time. And, mm. and so it's, it was pretty hard to think about, okay, I need to, I need to kind of come up with this in my head. I have to come up with this in my head and then communicate it on the page so that other people can see it as well. And, you know, I think I did an okay job with it in, for the most part, I hope in, in after the fall um, and, uh, and before the dawn, 
But then I felt even more pressure with Neo because Neo is such a physical character. Um, even aside from her, the way that she communicates, like hmm. her charm comes across in the way her body moves, her expressions, um, all of those things. And that was extremely difficult to to convey. And I think I think that there are not that many fight scenes in Roman Holiday, comparatively speaking. But I also thought that it made sense because it's early on with her. Like she's still like kind of early on in training. Mm. Um and and uh you know there's like three or four years, three to five years, I guess, before you see her on the show proper in the in the continuity of the book to the to the series, uh, because this takes place before volume one. Um so that's a lot of training and fighting and you know things that 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 she learns. Um, despite her, you know, in addition to her sort of natural um abilities. And um and Roman isn't really a physical character. He doesn't fight that often, you know, so so that wasn't so hard. Right, um, he off as a bit more of a verbal type of guy. You know, he has other people fight, and he he can kind of hold his own, but he's not going to get into a huge battle, you know, one on one for the most part, or one against you know many people. Um, so there, so there was that as well. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit, it was a little bit challenging, <laughs> I would say. Uh, uh, in terms of making semblances <laughs> for new characters or characters we know. What is the process from your perspective on well making a semblance? Uh, yeah, again, again, uh, thinking about like what would be a cool power, right? And uh, and then making sure that nobody has done that before on the show or nobody has done it in quite that way on the show. Um, and because a semblance is also really tied to the character, right? Like once you have that mm-hmm. semblance um, or you have the character, the two of them are, are sort of connected. Yeah in your in your mind and you need to kind of they need to kind of uh uh fit each other so so that's kind of it's kind of kind of trying to come up with superpowers you know like what and then also think about like what what could fit into this world as well like what's not going to be too much um but you know almost anything goes like you have characters who can teleport you can have characters who can who can fly you know like there's there's so many there's there's so much uh possibility and then you know you also don't necessarily want to waste like a really cool semblance on like a minor character um you know, so, so that's kind of, you know, it was oh, yeah, more challenging. I, th- I understand that. Yeah. The, the most challenging thing. And unfortunately, so I didn't write a semblance for, for Roman. Like Roman is just an example of somebody who never unlocked a semblance um, or, you know, um, or may not have one mm-hmm. like Neo. And of course, Neo already had a semblance. So I just had to figure out how to communicate her, her semblance on the page. Um, it was more difficult um, for after the fall when I was establishing the semblances of um, three out of uh, four of coffee, right, and mm-hmm. uh, and the the villains, mm. yeah, yeah, and then also um, August and um, and Edward, because um, they were such that was such an important part of the book, like you know, because their semblance was kind of like the root of everything that was going mm-hmm. on. Um, so that was yeah. really, that was a really, um, that conflict. thank you. Yeah. That was a really, that was really important. Um, and this one was like the semblances I'm co- I was coming up with were really more for, for minor characters. Um, and so there was like, a, it was like a less pressure. It's you know, certainly like rock salt and like candy floss. And, you know, I don't even know if I think there's some, yeah, there's semblances mm-hmm. were, were part of the fight. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing I did ask, I did try to f- find out what, what little misses semblance was and i was i was kind of told that it was in like combat ready or it was like implied from combat ready and i couldn't figure it out and i think i asked them about it but because they were really busy um and we were just moving so fast i never got any sort of confirmation on little mrs uh, semblance so i didn't use it because otherwise i actually i actually thought about having little miss fight roman one-on-one uh, when she comes to his his apartment, and I ended up not doing that. It's probably best that that I don't mm. do that because you don't really see Lil Miss fight. Like she really is absolutely like one hundred percent like the one who like leads others. But I thought it would have been a cool scene to see quote see you know on the page. Um, I but I could, yeah, I just never got you know cool. sometimes sometimes I ask questions and and I don't get a response, and that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no answer. It just means that either they missed it or 
you know, whatever happened. Um, and I don't necessarily push cause yeah, I just need to keep, time to I, need, I need to keep, yeah. I need to keep going. Um, but since we were talking about candy floss and rock salt and, and, and semblances and naming conventions, I did want to mention one little, one little interesting detail for you guys, um, that, that I never had an opportunity to mention is, uh, there's this bank teller that Roman interacts with in Roman holiday when he goes on his like crime spree in Vale. And, and the and the bank teller he interacts with is named Fred, right? Which you know on the surface is not a color, Durst? but you know, but Fred. again, like again, you have like you know, so many characters may just have a name, and then they they probably have a surname, right? That's a color, um, so it's fine. And nobody ever asked about this, mm. but when I when I sent that back to Rooster Teeth, I explained it. So when I was go- when I, somehow when I was googling, because I I don't know where the, I got the name Fred from, but when I was googling for colors, I came up with there's a band. There's a band in our world called the Color Fred. So, so I named the character Fred. <laughs> <laughs> the Color Fred. That's, that is definitely. <laughs> it kind of works. That's actually I mean, really clever. It involves a color. Works, works in I mean, when my I head. Think of, I have like. It, that's right, so I have like, absolutely uh, perfect. That is Fred Flintson and Fred Jones. So I think of like blonde orange. And stuff when I think Fred, Black, but it actually does still blue. work pretty well. Yeah, or you think about like one of those Flint, Flintstone mm. vitamins or something like that. Yeah, but... it's like the sort of faded color. Flintstone gummies, hell yeah. Yeah, I think I might have had a hard time selling that one. It's like, yeah, he's named Fred because he's based off of Fred Flintstone. Like, then I think they might have been like, you know what? I think we're gonna find. I think we're gonna find a different writer for the for the rest of the series. Uh, oh no! But thank you. You know, your services are no longer required. <laughs> If someone gave me said they had a character based off Fred Flintstone, I'd pay him like a hundred bucks. <laughs> Just, I don't care what you do with him. You, you gotta use him, though. So, yeah. So the semblances. So that was yeah. That uh, was that's basically you yeah. know where I come from on that. <laughs> Beautiful. Um. So I've got a final couple of questions here before we transla- uh, transfer ourselves over. I almost said translate, that would have been bad. Uh, <laughs> before we transfer over to the multitudes of fan questions, uh, do you have any plans uh, in your terms for Ruby of this year? Uh, other than hopefully watching Ruby, uh, Volume 9, um, and finding out whatever, well, finding out whatever this Team Ruby thing is. Um, I... I cannot mm. say yet whether or not I have anything because I don't actually know for sure. Like I'd love to, I'd love to write another book, um, but there's nothing you know uh, firm that I can say um, at this point. Um, so fingers crossed. Like I'd love to, I'd love to do more with Ruby if I have the opportunity. But I don't, I don't necessarily make all those decisions. Um, Rooster Teeth doesn't necessarily even make all those decisions. Like sometimes it, it comes down to the publisher and like what they're what they're interested in doing. Um, so I'm hoping I'm hoping we can do more, but uh, I can't I can't say. The the last question I had is, uh, do you think there's going to be any kind of uh, plans for the ten year anniversary for Ruby to make a novel in the future? Or? Oh, um, I don't know. Do you think that's I, I mean, I haven't heard any. I haven't heard anything about it yet. I I would be surprised if they didn't do something. Um, I like I don't know if it would be a book or or whatever. Um, or whatever their ten if they have a ten year anniversary or ten. Yeah, I don't know if they have a ten year anniversary plan, um, in place. But uh, you know, I I like I said, I can't I can't I can't I'm not I'm not currently Confirmed. involved with anything. Um, yeah. you know, hopefully that'll change. Yeah. But. <laughs> Hopefully, I'd love to see another book from you. Jesus, Thank you. <laughs> be awesome. You know, um, I, you know, it's sort of like I'm on two minds yeah. of it. It's like uh, I, I would love to do another one because I, I love doing this, um, and there are stories I would definitely like to tell. But um, there's some, you know, I think I think Roman Holiday was pretty well received from what I can tell, and and there's something to be said about ending on a high note, you know. Um, so like, you know. It's always good it's to enti- hit the mark. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe this is one of those situations where like only the odd numbered books are were really good. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> um, but you know, I'd like to do I'd like to do oh. more, and you know, I'm I'm always up for it. So you know, Scholastic Rooster Teeth, 
um, the if they just have to ask, they just have to ask, and and you know I have to have the the bandwidth to do it. But uh, you know anything they want me to be involved with, I'm I'm always up for it because um, um, I I love I love the series, I love the world, I love the characters. Um, it's been really cool to be a part of that, and uh, I think I can I can I can continue continue con- to contribute to to um, the overall uh, franchise. You know, if if given the opportunity. Hmm. Um, so now um, let's just gonna skid out all over the fan questions here. See how many we can get done today. Uh, yeah. To everyone watching and submitting into uh, submitting in their questions. Uh, hopefully we can get them all answered. If not, there's always future times to kind of ask these questions. <laughs> um. <clears throat> so from pardon me, from Andrew uh, Android Warrior. Uh, how did it feel when Kruby, Scholastic, Rooster Teeth reached out to you and inquired about you writing the first Ruby books? Uh, well, obviously it was awesome. Like it's, it's always, it's always really, um, it just, it really feels good when somebody reaches out to you and say, Hey, I, you know, I like your work and I, I think you would be good to write this, this project, you know, like they, they want me, it's nice to be wanted, right? Like you, yeah. yeah. So, so that was great. And, and at the time that, that I was approached, I did not know much about Ruby. I had, I had kind of taken a, a couple years uh, where I just didn't follow really any, any anime or TV or anything. Cause I was, I had a, I had a, a son and I was just really focused on raising him and, and, and working and everything. So, so then I started looking at Ruby and I was like, wow, that's really awesome. So I felt really excited about the prospect. Um, but then I also felt intimidated because it had such a huge fan base um, so then I, then, you know, the, the doubt starts coming into your head. Like every, every writer has this like imposter syndrome. I think every creator goes through imposter syndrome is like, wait, do they, can I really do this? Like, do they really want me? Um, and I actually had to audition for it. Um, so I wrote, um, I wrote, uh, I think I wrote some possible novel ideas, but then I also had to write like a scene, uh, like a chapter that just kind of showed how I would write Ruby. Um, and nobody's seen this. I don't know if I'll, I'll get to share it at some point. I actually don't know who, who, if it's if it's able to be shared, but I wrote a scene uh, with the with with mm. from Ruby's perspective, um, and uh, um, and they liked it, <laughs> so like they so I got I got the job, so that was awesome too because then that that felt really good because like they also they also just liked you know my writing and thought that I was a good fit for the project as well. So so yeah, it was really exciting and then and then also intimidating as I as I you know learned more about the series. And uh, got into it. I, I got really excited about it. But then I was also like starting to feel kind of the weight, you know, the the weight of of doing a good job with it. Like you always want to do a good job, but I felt like this uh, one in particular would have a lot more eyes on it, you know. So I, not only do I have to make my editor happy and you know Rooster Teeth happy, but then there's the fans who are going to basically um, they become the owners of the of the of the story after it's published. And I had to hope that they would like it. All right, so uh, t- rather topical name, Neopolitan asks, huh. "What D and D alignment would you say Neo has?" Personally, I think chaotic neutral, but I'm curious what y'all think. Yeah, so I feel like you know, at one point she might have been chaotic neutral. So I had to, I'm not a D and D player. Like my wife plays and my friends play. Um, I've never really I've never really gotten into it. Um, but uh, so I had to I just looked up the alignments again. And uh, I think I think I would actually go with chaotic evil because a chaotic evil character is actually bent on revenge and destruction. And I think that Neapolitan, at least as we see her, you know, currently in the in the current timeline of the show, um, has definitely progressed to that point. Mm. She is she is hell bent on on killing yeah, Ruby absolutely. and and really al- almost doesn't matter what happens to her, right? Mm. Or anyone else who gets in her way. Mm. Very, very uh, good way of putting it, I suppose. Hey? <laughs> um, from Rusty, we have uh, in Roman holidays, uh, Roman had her t- uh, had a teammate called Chameleon. Was this a nickname due to her semblance, or was it actually her name? Hey, Rusty, thanks for the question. Um, so it is not. So, so if it was if it was her actual name, it would probably be like almost comic booky too appropriate. 
right? Um, I, I think of it as as yeah. not a nickname, though, because uh, her nickname is like Cammy, like Roman calls her Cammy. Um, you know, it's like a shorthand of it. So I think that it's like like Neapolitan. I think that Chameleon is a name that she's chosen for herself. You know, um, even even you look at somebody like a mm. character like Ta- Talk on the show. Was that character's name really Talk? You know, from birth, and then they just happen to have a, a semblance that's related to time, or is that just like that could have been a nickname? But then that becomes their name. You know, so um, sometimes I think your your yeah, it, your nickname like becomes your identity. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so I'm gonna go with yeah. uh, it's just it's just ch- chameleon is just her name. You know. And it may have been like a, 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 a or her name might have been like Cami, and then she maybe goes by Chameleon. You know, could go either way. Hmm. So, uh, Bolt Indy asks, uh, "Did you have any other ideas for antagonists before or after the fall was released?" Uh, you mean like this? Despite uh, well, I guess Bolt Indy can't answer. But if you if if they mean. Aside from like Burlak and and Carmen, uh, actually no. Um, I think I think I knew we wanted characters who were not attached to Salem in some way. Like that kind of just fleshes that you know fleshes out the world. Like there are other threats out there, right? Um, and and it wasn't even until I think oh, towards yeah. the end of the book where where we start to suggest that there's like a bigger like the crown, like there's a bigger element beyond beyond those two characters. But actually, I think, as, if I recall, my earliest uh, outlines had those characters in some capacity. I think they might have had different names at a certain point. But um, those characters were going to be, you know, hun- huntsmen um, who were, uh, well, hunting people with semblances. Mm. Hmm. I love that. Um, another topical name, Velvet Scalatino. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, they ask, would you like to do a Velvet backstory or just a singular Velvet book in general? Um, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know. Intro. I think, yeah, I feel like the, the coffee books, um, especially the second one are pretty Velvet centric. And at least I got to do a little bit of Velvet's, Velvet's backstory in that one. Um, you know, I wouldn't mind, uh, getting to write her character more about, I don't know that she needs her own book because they were already pretty, pretty focused on her again, part, partially because she was such a, uh, partially because she's a, yeah. a, like a fan favorite also partially because like I knew the Integral most about character. her. So, That's you know, nice. I knew the most about her cause I'd actually seen more of her personality like on screen and she ended up becoming like a very, a, a very strong viewpoint character for, uh, after the fall in that she's like living this new place. She feels like she's failed. Uh, to protect her home, you know, she misses her home. She's living in this other place that's really horrible. She doesn't like it. Um, she's dealing with like she has a great a great team, but she still is kind of like, you know, she has a lot of like personal kind of drama and growth, character growth that that she can um, explore. And I think that she evolves further in in Before the Dawn. Um, if I got to do another coffee book, I I honestly would would focus more on fewer characters and 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 characters that we had not seen much of. Um, so probably Scarlet and Sage, um, possibly Yatsu. Well, Yatsu got, Yatsu got a little bit of limelight, but possibly like Yatsu and Fox. Like I would, I would probably narrow the viewpoints down a little bit more and and maybe get some interactions between characters that, that you don't um, see interacting together too often. But uh, probably if I did do another coffee book, um, it would be within the continuity of the series as it is now, which gives me lots of other story ideas and, and possibilities. So um, yeah, it would be cool to do another coffee quote coffee book. I guess you would start calling it like really a vacuo book, you know, like following following that that through line. But mm. we'll, we'll, mm. it remains to be seen if anything would be if if that would happen and if it would even be necessary, right? Yeah, who knows? Uh, yeah. so. uh, Lavender Rare asks if you could write for any of the main characters, Ruby, Juniper, Oscar, Crow, etc. Who would it be? Hmm. Um, man, it, it, you know, so it'd be a character, I guess, that probably you don't, you don't, you, you don't see a lot of their backstory, right? So, um, I think we've seen a lot of most of those characters. Mm. We we don't get a lot about Crow yet, um, but you know, we kind of know his deal. 
to some extent. Um, Oscar, we kind of saw him really from the point, from the moment he became relevant. We sort of saw Oscar already. I think out of all of those main characters that 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 we've seen that that we've mentioned, I probably would want to do a Pira book, um, or a story about Pira. You know, pre yeah. pre, pre uh, volume, volume one. one. Um, which would be cool and also really tragic and probably, yeah, it would just be, it would be fun though. Cause we don't, we don't have a lot about her and there's something about her it character. That is so, she's so, she's so wholesome. Like she's so interesting and wholesome and humble mm. and, and, and um, j- j- just generous. Like, and there's something like awkward about, like I, there's, yeah, I could write that. Like I, I could totally write that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we have Therathon, uh, sorry, that's not, we have Thern, uh, Thernathon, Jesus Christ, that fucking name, uh, <laughs> apologies, um, following along the line of, if you could write for any characters, who are your favorite characters to write about? Um, I mean, out of the ones that I've already written, I, I probably would say like Fox was definitely a really fun one to write. Um, he's so goofy. Um, <laughs> um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think I, I really, I think I really, I, I liked writing, um, obviously I liked writing Velvet and I really liked writing, uh, to some extent like Yatsu. Um, he's such a, he's such a sweet, sweet boy. Um, you know, there, sweet I definitely beef. feel, I feel, I feel a lot of attachment to, to coffee. Um, even though I didn't, you know, necessarily create those characters, I, I feel like I did, you know, some of them anyway. Um, so yeah, probably, probably, mm. probably Fox and probably Fox and Velvet. Um, yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, Elijah Adler asks: Was it difficult to capture the personalities of characters who initially haven't been created by yourself? Um, it's it. It depends. It depends on how much of their character was established on the show and how much we've seen them. So, so Roman was not difficult at all. Um, really like his voice just, you know, I was able to just kind of tap into that. Like he comes across really well on the show. Um, so that was easy to, to springboard off of, uh, Neo again, her personality, like you get her personality. I got to extrapolate on that. Um, velvet wasn't too bad, you know, again, but like the characters that you don't see that much Coco, uh, Yatsu Fox, um, even even characters, you know, like oh, people people really don't like the way I handle Team Indigo, um, but but everything that I wrote, everything that I wrote, that I did not invent those characters, I I based it off of what was apparent to me on the show. So I'm going off of whatever interactions I, I see, their expressions, like anything that I can take to extrapolate a character from, right? Um, so, so in that sense, like, uh, uh, Nolan, Nolan was actually kind of fun, kind of fun to write because, because, because his backstory, at least his, his, the tragic events, uh, following the fall of Beacon make him an interesting character, you know? Um, so, Hmm. so I think, so it's challenging when I don't have enough to go on. If I, if I, if I can't get like you know, a dossier or something. There, there's, there was no dossier. If there's not enough information on the show or on the wiki or something that I can't draw from, it's, it's much more challenging because I still need to kind of come up with something that feels true to that character um, while also um, making them, you know, interesting and, and, and to some extent my, my own characters, you know? Um, I still, I was, I was still will maintain that nothing I, I, I established for team Indigo directly controverts anything you see on the show. <laughs> so How that's much the main do thing. We see them on the show, like in a fight. <laughs> so see, we get one fight. One, scene it's just team. one fight. It's that it. That's yeah, that it. one you know. fight scene against Team Sun, and then they're just gone. They weren't even yeah. in the final fight of Beacon. They just so, left, which it fit perfectly for them to just dip. right. And that and that fi- that <laughs> figures into it as well. It's like okay, I look at to see which characters are there. You know, and that speaks something about them. Like, it speak for it may speak only to the fact, like the the system could only render X number of characters or whatever. Fine, that could be the reason. But those characters weren't there. Why were they not there? Are they dead? Are they running? Did they just like nope out of it? Like, and if they noped out of it, what does that say about them as characters, right? And 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 Indigo and in, you know, and I, I think in Indigo in particular, like I know I know one of the issues was we 
decided to conflate their characters uh, with some of the other, you know, but because they were vacuans, like they also convey a certain attitude, you know, from vacuo. And again, like you don't get that much of their character. So anyway, I, I don't want to get defensive about it. I'm just saying like my, my goals are uh, when I'm working on characters that I don't have any, that have much information about is I look to see what's there, whether it's on the show or in some yeah, ancillary material or, uh, something that the 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 sh- the crew has said about them, you know, that can be considered canon, or if they've been on like Ruby Chibi or whatever. Like I look for anything that I can use to build on that character because I want to first of all make sure that they are true to to your you know what you've seen of them already, and maybe what you think about them. But then also I need to make sure that I am not contradicting as much as I can help it. I am not contradicting anything that has been previously established. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to retcon anything. You know, I want it all to kind of fit. Um, Even if some of the things that fit, like you have to contort things a little bit to get it to fit. But, you know, that that's where I'm coming from with it, you know, but it's definitely harder when when you have characters who haven't even spoken, (laughs) you know, like, how do I communicate? How do I convey them? And then and then it becomes a matter of like, how important are they to this story? Like the story that I'm writing, like, you know. Um, if they're not a main character, if they're not going to lead their own book, then I, I'm probably going to spend a little less time developing them than I am with, uh, you know, uh, Yatsuhashi, you know, um, other characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have about 18 minutes left within the recording. Uh, I think we can make it to 10 questions, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And we kind of wrap it up after that. That sounds good. Uh, we have from Pink Rose here. Uh, how did you manage to? Uh, how did you imagine Fox's voice to sound when you wrote his lines? Um, kind of, kind of snarky. Um, I think you know, given given looking back retro retroactively, retrospectively on it, I could kind of see. Uh, oh man, what's his name? Ben. Ben something. The guy who who plays uh, Sonic, <laughs> Sonic in the movies. Um, <laughs> oh, what's his Jack- name? Yeah, Ben, ben something. Affleck? Ben. No, it's not Affleck. It's uh, it's not, it's not uh Affleck. he's also on Shapiro? like Ducktales. He's Ducktail. He's on Ducktales as well. Oh. Um, Ben Schwartz. I could kind of see Ben Schwartz, like a Ben Schwartz kind of voice. If we could get him, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> or a good impersonator, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think I think di- I would be it would be his voice, but like dial down just a little bit because part of Fox is he's very deadpan. Uh, in my head, he's very deadpan, so he's saying something yeah. snarky, but he's kind of saying it such that you can't tell if he's kidding or not. Oh, right? I love characters like it's sarcasm, that. but yeah. it's like it's a sarcasm, and it's the it's the it. kind of it's the kind of thing where like that really gets gets on people's nerves like i had i had i i have been a very sarcastic person and i used to work with somebody who we just didn't seem to not like each other uh or we had trouble communicating because we were both sarcastic and we could never tell when the other person was being serious or not um and once we kind of understood that about Mm. about each other like we got (laughs) got to be much better friends uh from that so so yeah it's sort of that sardonic sarcastic uh wit it's just like that voice it's very sometimes he's very quiet and he just says something and you don't even realize that he's he's insulted you or made a joke until like five minutes later you know wait that was an insult (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, all right so uh bionic d4c asks hello yeah irishman uh can you name three things that you wanted to add to any of the books that you couldn't um yeah i think i can um so so in an early draft of uh i think i've talked about this some of this before in an early draft of after the fall i actually uh thought it'd be really cool to kind of tease the summer maiden i don't actually have any information about the summer maiden by the way but um Aww. if 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 ruby if kruby um had authorized Aww. it um she would have been uh fox would have been fighting burlack you know in the in the sandstorm and in really bad shape and then the summer maiden was going to come and help him but he wouldn't know who it was or what she did because he's blind so so it would have been a very subtle kind of cameo he just like, um, senses their mind, like, oh, they're I'm there, helping you. you know, but, um, and I thought it would be really cool to like bring in the summer maiden, but you still don't know anything about them, right? But, um, 
you know, I couldn't do that. Of course, of course I couldn't do that. Um, and it's fine. And it's actually better. Like it's, you don't want some random person to just show up, you know, um, the, to, to save him at the last minute. Right. Um, the other thing was Penny. I really wanted at, at some point, like my editor and I thought it'd be really cool. So in, in before the dawn, uh, Yatsu goes up against uh, a, a surprise opponent in kind of the cage match. Um, some of this sounds ridiculous when I'm relating it again, but um, you know he's in this cage match at the you know the secret uh, club, the Fight Club, and uh, we thought it would be really cool if somebody had like rebuilt Penny, mm-hmm. you know, somebody just took the pieces and rebuilt her. And of course, thinking about it now, that doesn't make any sense. Like it wouldn't have been possible. Um, and of course, when we mentioned that, you know, Rusty was like, "Yeah, you can't." You can't do that because she's coming back. So, so I was very excited that she was I mean, coming it, back. It technically, wouldn't be Penny. It's just the robot, yeah. right? Yeah, it would have been a machine, you know. Um, but it would have been shocking, right, for them to for Yatsu to come up against. Wait a second, uh, come up against Penny, and that's what mm. we were going for. He wanted, and we wanted it to be somebody like really, really shocking. And actually, I can mention this. This isn't the third thing I was going to mention, but this is I, that club, that Fight Club, originally in an early draft was run by Junior. Aww. Um but then ultimately we ended up taking that out. Thought it was maybe too distracting and, and Vail vacuum. doesn't really seem like a junior kind of thing, but then I was able to bring junior into mm. R- Roman holiday. So that was awesome. And then the third thing was uh, Coco's semblance originally was going to mm. be, um, uh, be, she was able to manipulate uh, the molecular density of things, which is how she can pick up her, uh, her, uh, her bag, you know, which is, is that how she can make the giant minigun shrink into a purse? Well, well, that's what I was thinking, but no, because Rooster Teeth said you can't do that because molec- manipulating molecular density is is R- Ruby's semblance, and so so that was the first inkling that I had of like what her Aww. actual semblance was until they mentioned it, it on the show. Yourself. So that that set off like a series of of things where I come up with something for the book and they're like actually you can't use that because that's going to show up later on. So <laughs> which is kind of kind of nice like it kind of shows that I'm at least on the right track, you know, like we're sort of thinking we're kind of thinking along the same lines. Cool. Hmm. Um We'll finish off on 11, I suppose. Uh, Amia Blesson here has her question, which is, uh, what personally towards you, Myers, is the hardest aspect of writing these books that leaves you writing and scrapping several pages for possibly days on end? Um, I think the the hardest part is really um, coming up with a plot that works. Um, you know, thinking about something mm. that's, that is, is, is significant enough to warrant... Um, a book, but also like, kind of like small enough, you know, like it doesn't, the, the plots that I come up with, I think maybe before, before the fall uh, kind of, kind of is almost on the same level, but like, you've got the big, the big uh, bad out there. You've got Salem out there. Um, and that's obviously the, the big thing, but um, you're coming up with a plot that seems important enough, like feels like they're saving the world, you know? to some degree or something that makes sense. So, so Roman holiday was really challenging because I needed to come up with a, with a plot that felt big to the characters. Um, but also doesn't have a huge impact on the world because, you know, it's, it predates volume one. So we sort of already know like, uh, some of the, it had to be sort sort of almost like smaller, smaller Mm. potatoes. Right. Um, but it had to be important to the characters and it had to be something Mm. that they could deal with. And it's also like, you're dealing with villains, so it had to be something like, what would villains, you know, villains, what does winning the day mean to villains? Um, we robbed a bank. We robbed a bank. We stole all the coffee. I know people, <laughs> some we people stole are, candy actually, from a baby. People are, 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 are yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like, you know, we but took sort of all like, the cookies but also, from the cookie jar. <laughs> but the, the tricky thing with Roman Holiday was it had to be something that was on the same level of stealing all the dust, but wasn't dust. Because he's going to do that later, right? right. So it kept having come kind of like it mm-hmm. almost be, it became like a running gag. It was like he's just not thinking about dust. Everyone else is like you should you should control the dust, and he's just not he's not there. You know he's not there. He's coming up with these weird plans. You should control the dust. Eh, I want he's to. He's like, uh, oh, that's ridiculous. Bank. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know. I'm gonna I'm just gonna rob the banks, like you know, um, money. And and you want to rob the banks, become a billionaire. Yeah. So so for them though, 
their winning the day for them was was screwing up the other organizations, like screwing up the other villains' plans, so that they could then kind of fill the void, right? Mm. Um, and that's kind of like a win, you know. It's it, it, in, at the end of the day. <laughs> nice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I feel that uh, I feel that we're. Uh, running out of time, so I guess I should finish this up, eh? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the, the questions. questions. <laughs> yeah. no. That's alright. As always, next time. Ghost, you want to run the outro? You wanna I do have it? an outro. You want to do the outro? You can do the outro. Because I was terrible on the intro. <laughs> what do I say is an outro? Well... Find it. <laughs> it was lovely having the ever prevalent EC Myers here. Thanks. I want to thank him again for joining on the podcast. Thank you kindly. This was fun. Uh, I want to thank. I want to thank everyone who sent in their questions. Where I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all, but there's always next time. So don't stress. We'll keep these on backlog. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. Um, Yeah, I think going you're on all, Spotify now, I believe really as well. Yeah. yeah, I think I think we're going on Spotify. I don't think it's been kind of brought up yet that yeah. we're starting we're, to get in the swing of there. Spotify. I don't know if I was allowed to say that. <laughs> I probably <laughs> shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Whoops! Whoops. Uh. Uh. Ta-da! Surprise! <laughs> but, surprise! But um, yeah, we're going to start getting the swing of uh, podcasts on Spotify so you can listen on the go instead of having to listen on YouTube just specifically. Um, so we get to hear more of this beautiful man in the future, hopefully. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Um, and you also have to put up with Ghost's annoyingness, but I mean, yeah. that's another thing for another day. <laughs> you guys are stuck <laughs> with me. <laughs> but... Thank you again from the bottom of our hearts. I don't know if Velva wants to kind of chime in, jump in at all, give any words to finish up on. But um, other than that, I don't think there's much left. All right. Well, until next time. Hopefully there's a next time. I, I ex hope. <laughs> you want to say anything, Velvet? Velvet? <laughs> no, I, uh... I think his mic's broken. Whoops. Either that or, either that or Discord just does not he's like gone in, He's gone into full Neo mode. Yep. We gotta read uh, sign language. Alright. Read sign language through the speech. This is going to be great. All right. Well, <laughs> take care, gents. Have a good rest of the day. Um, thanks again to everyone for the, for the great questions. You have questions. a lovely thanks day yourself. Me. Thank you. All right. You take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.